Do you know what time it is? It's Supernatural Story Time. And if you're easily scared, and even if you're not, there's only one thing left to do. Just turn off the lights, because these are stories that you listen to only in the in dark. dark. When Nighttime Falls, Volume 1, Story 1. There are some places in Texas I advise you to go to. San Antonio, Austin, Poteet, Dallas, Lavernia, just to name a few if you want to experience real Texas in a breathtaking way. And then there's Casusco, Texas, a place that I would never bring up in normal conversation. It's a place you don't go to. It's a place you drive far away from when nighttime falls. It's a place where your car stops and stalls and you feel sweat beating down your neck as you try to jiggle the keys in fear. You don't go to Casusco ever. Pull up Google Maps and try to find a town. Here's a hint, you won't. You'll go immediately to a marker labeled Casusco Meat Market, but no indicator that there's a town anywhere. There's no street named Casusco Street or Avenue, just Casusco Meat Market. It's really more or less an abandoned town. Only about 10 people reside there and countries separates them all in between. There's a meat market, like I said, and an old dance hall that people used to go to back in the 1970s. There used to be a school who resided there, but they merged with the POF ISD way back in the 1970s. Even the history of Kosciuszko is lackluster. A simple Polish town that was established as a rural trading post for settlers as they headed to San Antonio. No battles were fought there, no historical significance, except technically one. The story of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre is a fabricated story based on Ed Gein, who murdered and sewed skins of women together. Urban legend steadfastly hold on to the belief that the real incident of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre happened in Poth, Texas. This isn't true because, in reality, it was Kosciuszko where the legend began. Poth got attached to it because Kosciuszko lived and died with a very difficult sounding name. When the movie came out, the locals murmured and whispered among themselves that Kosciuszko's secret and dark past had been taken by Hollywood and transformed into a slasher film, complete with a cannibal family and bloody corpses that lined the grounds. It's a coincidence. The film had nothing to do with the town, but have you ever seen something that was so eerily coincidental and similar that you couldn't help but feel a connection? Even the lonely, isolated feeling of the landscape felt like the harsh, hard ground of the ghost town. Kosciuszko is home to a violent clan of inbred cannibals that live in the countryside, kidnapping and raping victims before eating them alive if the victims didn't already will themselves to die by that time anyway. Nobody exactly knows where they came from, but rumor is that they were simply left behind when people started to move away. It's agreed that they're Polish descent and otherwise unintelligent humans, but that's all anyone can say. Right before Texas Chainsaw Massacre came out, a young naked and bloody man drove his car into a street post in Poth, Texas and got out screaming wildly in the dark of the night the police and the ambulance came, bringing him to hospital center in Floresville. After sedating him enough to clean him, the nurses and doctor found irregularities. He was bruised and bloodied, and his flesh had been stripped on his thighs and buttocks, like a knife had been skinning him. He had no tongue and was unable to speak. His wrists were hanging off the joint, as if it had been bound so tightly that it was essentially severing them clean off. His ankles were shattered and broken, and it seemed like it was pure will and luck that he even made it that far to Poth in a car nonetheless. The police detectives gave him a pen and paper and asked him what happened. The only thing he wrote was Kasusku and died a day later from injuries and infections. His body was studied by the medical examiner of San Antonio, who took interest in the case, and the medical examiner promptly remarked that this would be his last autopsy, as this was the worst he'd seen. Shortly after he signed the papers, 
the medical examiner resigned and moved out of Texas. The medical examiner reported that the young man had been held captive for a week or so, bound by something tight like rope or chains. His circulation was cut off in many parts of the body, requiring amputation of the fingers and toes. There were several infections raging in his body that would have eventually, by miracle, had not killed him. He was also tested positive for tetanus and fragments of rusty metal were found in his bloodstream. He was dehydrated, starved, and raped repeatedly in the rectum. Mouth and a hole in the base of the spine was found to be filled with semen. Shockingly, this did not result in paralysis, and the doctor still can't explain it. His tongue was missing, and the doctor presumed that it was cut using the same rusty blade as the fragments found in the bloodstream, as well as the skinning of his thighs and buttocks. He was also tested positive for HIV, which wound up quarantining the hospital. Blood, traces of semen, fluid, and rotted meat were found in his stomach as well as wristwatch. The guess is as good as anyone else's on how this poor man escaped his captors. The doctors theorized that maybe he freed himself by dislocating his wrist and slipping out of his bonds. How he was able to run was pure will to escape and survive in the car he might have stolen on a highway or from his captors. An informal police report differs, suggesting the man was meant to be tossed in the river nearby and overpowered his captors while in the car and operated into a frenzy. The weirder mystery was the word Kasusku. It wasn't any difficulty to see that he meant Kasusku, Texas, so the police began to search out there, starting with the Kasusku meat market. There, all they found was an elderly couple running the store as usual and selling pork rinds in plastic bags. A detective bought one to eat on the search and eventually, that was all the search actually accomplished. Nothing was found and nothing was gained. Nobody in the small town had seen or heard of the man and nobody reported a car missing or stolen. The detectives returned several times back over a course of months, attempting to secure more information. However, they were largely unsuccessful and considered the case had run cold. The last time they were there, they went back into the meat market. A young girl of maybe six or seven was sitting behind the counter, eating a type of Polish candy, while the detectives decided to go ahead and try to talk to her. He first bought a bag of pork rinds to try and start conversation, which he returned with energetic favor. She seemed pleasant enough, as any six-year-old would be. Then he offered her one of the pork rinds to curry favor. She declined. Mama says, I only eat those if they're made of piggies, she said. The detective laughed a bit and told her that they were made of pig, hence pork rinds. She shook her head. No, they're not. I see Grandpa make them. He gets a shipment of skin every month, and while they're screaming and crying and hollering, he takes the skin right off and tosses it in the fryer. Immediately, the detectives became unsettled and left, opting to hand over their pork rinds to the lab. They called dispatch and attempted to find the old couple. Every time they went to the meat market, it was closed, and every time they tried to find the old couple, everyone in the town didn't remember them. After some digging through the history books and birth certificates to locate the identity of the couple, the detectives learned a terrifying fact. Everyone in Kosciusko is related. There's no deviancy in the family tree. Any settlers who immigrated there was blemished out mysteriously. The results came back. Now, this was back in the day when forensics did not exist, so DNA testing was a science fiction fantasy. The inspectors determined the pork rinds were of untraceable origin, but were definitely not made of pork or any hog products. This resulted in a search and seizure of the town. The town of Poth dispatched and requested help of several towns to seize all people of Kasusku. People were arrested and kids were transferred to Poth where they could not be in their family's possession. Violence and fights broke out. Homes were destroyed and torn apart as police searched into each and every home and building. In one home, they found equipment with noticeable blood. In another, fragments and bone were found, and yet another teeth were buried under the soft ground. Nobody was talking, and nobody was saying anything. This was before DNA, so the police couldn't determine what the blood was. The household claimed they butchered their own livestock. The teeth came from burying it for the tooth fairy. Bones and fragments were from slaying pigs with hammers. The rabbit hole went too deep, and the police didn't know what to do. 
so they shut down Kasusku and ferried the kids to the Poth ISD schools. When they could no longer hold the townspeople in custody, the townspeople moved out of the homes and went deeper into the country so they couldn't be found. Then the movie came out, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and everyone was utterly convinced someone in Kasusku sold the story. Of course, it was just coincidence. The two are related, and the case of Kasusku never went solved. By that time, everyone knew to stay away from Kasusku, and the kids who were shipped to the POF schools were bullied so hard that eventually they too left for the isolated countryside. The thing is, now Kasusku is trying to open up the doors again. The dance hall is open, and the meat market is under new management. Kasusku is trying to sell itself as a historic town and bring business back to the ghost town. People have gone there for the dances and insist that there's a homely, cowboy-like charm to the place and the pork rinds can't be beat. And the nice old couple who runs the meat market are just the best people I hear. Follow-up. So none of you heeded a warning. I did tell you to stay away from Kasusku. I guess it was a little absurd to assume you wanted to seek an adventure and would listen to prattling about dangerous this and dangerous that. Repeating this again, Kasusku is not a place you want to go to. My father called me today and told me about some kid in torn jeans and a hat walking into the Circle G Set restaurant in Poth, Texas and asking for direction to Kasusku. I'll be, he pronounced the name wrong. He was turned away by the manager of the restaurant because nobody even wanted to make eye contact with him. First off, don't go around messing up people's lives for a thrill. Have a little more courtesy than that. Then my father tells me that while he headed out to the oil fields, he ran into a trucker who drove through Kasusku. The trucker claimed that some people were poking around the ghost town as obnoxiously as possible. He doubted very seriously they found anything, but that's the thing. You don't find anything, Kasusku, at first. Kasusku finds you, and they're very good at finding you. Then you wish you hadn't found anything at all. My dad was then later driving near Kasusku and found an abandoned car on the outskirts of the ghost town. It was a four-door sedan with a decal sticker on the back. Ford, I think. So, if you're missing a car, someone found it. I really hope that that's all that went missing. My dad briefly considered calling a tow truck before the meat market of Kasusku had smoke coming out of the back. See, the smoke is real black and thick, almost too difficult to breathe. It looks like a plague, honestly. He hightailed it to the F out of there. Something is cooking, and he wasn't too keen on discovering what the hell made the smoke so dark like that. In fact, if you're outside of Floresville or Poth or maybe even Stockdale, stick your head out of your window and away from your computer for a second. Look towards the sky and tell me if you see any clouds lingering over a spot. Dark midnight clouds of heavy smoke. I heard it takes a long time for that kind of smoke to clear from the skies, especially if there's nonstop cooking going on. As certain as I always am, you guys think you're real sneaky. You looked around a spooky town and thought nobody saw you? You thought you were so slick just driving slowly and taking stock of the isolated backwater Hickville you stumbled on? Nobody saw you. It was the perfect drive-by rubbernecking. Kasusku saw you. They saw your car. They saw your friends. And they saw that you don't belong there. And you have no kin there. Those smokestacks don't rumble unless they expect a large crowd to cater to. There's a hitch in everyone's breath down in that area that's looking to the sky and praying to God that the smoke dies down. If there's no smoke, there's no food. Then no pork rinds to share around. Then there's no missing persons report being filed. So please, I ask you, don't go to Kasusku. You got one? Don't go for another. And you know who I'm talking to. You feel that sense of disbelief in the back of your head, talking to yourself that it's a scary story and Too vague to apply to you. The meat market has your name under coming soon in a placard in the front. In Polish, of course, but it's my best advice to you that you just take my word for it. After all, you don't want the placard to change to special of the day, right? Don't go to Kasusku. Story number two. 
Buford was a small town with a small population and little purpose besides churning out God-fearing generation after God-fearing generation. Hell, we even called the place the shadow of God because we hoped with enough prayer, the Lord would one day shine his light favorably upon us. Well, everyone else hoped that. I just went along with it, waiting for the day I could leave. The day would be sometime in the fall after months of convincing my parents They agreed to let me go to a college not too far away, and only if I took at least one class in theology. It wasn't worth the breath to continue the debate, so I enrolled in a demonology course, lied, and said it was history of Christianity, and I got to packing. Don't get me wrong. I'm not against religion. I've just been going to church every week for five hours a week since I was forming fingers in the womb. It was always long and full of fire and brimstone and love and hate and fear, a lot of fear. There was a fear of homosexuality and fear of abortion, but I picked up on the hypocrisy as I got older. No one else noticed it. If they did, I assumed it was just easier not to think about it. Nobody wants to be the outcast, the voice of dissent that ends up alone. I didn't blame them. This town was known to eat its young. My father had a friend named Eric. Well, Eric was a skeptical man, just as I was, but He wasn't afraid to speak his mind, but people started to listen. The mayor, the pastor, and even my father and his other buddies, they loved Eric when they could write him off as a drunk spouting nonsense guy. But what about when Eric rolled up his sleeves and stood up at a podium during mayoral elections? Whispers started. Those whispers turned into torches. Those torches turned into the hanging of Eric. He had no family outside of town, and no one was about to call the state police. Who wants to end up with a noose around their neck? Then there was peace. No one was left to speak out, to make people think about new views, new ideas. Then he came to town. I didn't know what happened to Father Michael. No one was sure where he went, and the church was buzzing with whispered gossip. Everyone was so focused on their own speculations wondering if the preacher had turned gay or cheated on his wife with that busty woman Marie from the flower shop, the one he always flirted with, or was too ashamed to return after that one time he misquoted Paul in his sermon, that they didn't notice the thin man in the holy garb limping to the podium. Brothers, sisters, friends, and enemies, let me speak to you. The whispers stopped immediately. The voice was like silken thunder, It was mesmerizing. I could feel the man's words dancing along my skin, raising goosebumps with a sudden electricity. But even now, I have no idea what Father Salvador looked like during that first speech. I know he was tall and thin and olive skin, but his face above the podium remained a blur in my memory. I have come to speak the word of God. Everyone sat riveted. Not a soul looking elsewhere, but at the pulpit, not a soul wondering who the stranger was. I am Father Salvador, and I've known you all for longer than you may think. He lowered his voice to something like fatherly smoke, easy to drink in, airy and soothing. Then thunder struck once more. I have come to tell you that God looked favorably upon this town. I have spoken with him. Finally, some movement in the crowd. It was Lindsay, Eric's widow. She was a fire and brimstone type of woman herself, distancing from her husband as he was gripped more and more by his sacrilegious madness. She helped plan his downfall, but Salvador tripped something in her. You have spoken to God? Why should we believe a stranger? What proof do you have besides such obvious lies? Father Salvador laughed. But it wasn't pleasing, it was that sputtering and gurgling sound Eric made as he swung on the noose. Lindsay took a step backwards, betraying her confidence a moment. My child, I have your body as proof. Then he addressed us all with grand sweeping gestures. This woman questions a man of God. Would a good and righteous person do such a thing? The room echoed with a collective, no. God is gone, my children. It is a person like this one that turned the Lord away from you. A person like this one that turned the Lord away from me. There were gasps and cries. There was rage. 
everyone jumped to their feet, and Lindsay didn't stand a chance. The pews cleared. Over the heads and bodies of those in front of me, I could see Lindsay with her arms up in defense, screaming as a man grabbed her wrist and yanked it outward. One woman took hold of the other wrist, pulling opposite the man. The crowd closed in further and through gaps between bodies. I could see the pulling. Flashes of Lindsay raised off the ground with hands around her ankles and wrists and neck, all being twisted in different directions. The wall of bodies became too thick to see through. There was screaming, so much pain screaming. Then there wasn't. I turned away. I ran home, the whole time imagining Lindsay's head being held triumphantly above the cheering crowd. I could only go home. There was nowhere else. I could only wait. I could only try to forget as I tried to do and failed to do after Eric's execution. I knew my parents were in that mob somewhere, and I knew my father would surely come home with blood on his hands, praising the sermon. But there was no praise. Maddie, the door slammed shut, and I heard heavy boots on the stairs. Maddie, I know you left. I couldn't use the window. Two stories up, I'd break a leg if I jumped, so I hugged the pillow to hide the knife I had been holding, waiting with hoping I didn't need to use it. My father gingerly pushed the door open and stepped into the room, giving an awkward scan before stopping his gaze on me. There was blood on his cheeks and on his slacks. Listen, sweetheart, I know sometimes religion can be a bit mm, complicated. Thou shalt not kill. My father's eyes widened, surprised by my coldness. I usually feigned understanding, but watching a woman be dismembered goes a bit over the line for me. Yes, yes, that is a commandment. But didn't Moses have a hand in killing the firstborn Egyptians just before receiving those commandments? He smiled. I didn't. His voice hardened, and he continued. What I mean is, Madison, that sometimes certain things are justified to protect our faith. Murdering a woman for asking a question doesn't seem very justified. He sighed and got up to leave, but before he closed the door, his posture changed. He looked back with a half smile, eyes narrowing. God's gun, honey. That's on you. Better lock your door. Joseph Cooper was next. Mr. Cooper owned a drugstore in the center of town and was innocuous. He was old, but rumors would have you believe that he found religion and moved here after one too many arrests. As for why he had been arrested, that was an ever-changing part of the story, the most common reasons being something related to fighting or gambling. It was hard to believe any of it, though. He was always so quiet and calm, only speaking when he needed to speak and never saying anything anyone could consider controversial. He was, at least for as long as I knew him, human wallpaper. But he owned a pharmacy. That was enough. Cooper, open the fucking door. Connor Richfield, a classmate of mine, who must have had a grizzly bear for a grandfather, pounded a meaty fist against the glass. His girlfriend, Temperance, stood beside him, with her lips pursed in a scowl. Behind the duo, a small group had gathered. They rained hands and feet against the window and door, and I, still numb from church, could only note how Mr. Cooper was wise when he paid extra for the reinforced glass, despite the town's assertion that nothing bad happens here. I stood several yards away, frozen, stupidly hoping that I couldn't be detected if I stood still in the middle of the street. Then a shot. Glass exploded outward, and the mob scattered. Connor lay on the ground, a hole in his chest from where the shotgun blast had hit him. I backed up a step and felt a hand on my shoulder for a moment before the lanky form of Father Salvador glided past me. He looked distorted, like the air around him was rising off a hot road. What is this, friends? He spoke gently, halfway between, a growl and a purr. Temperance, who had knelt down and sobbed beside Connor as he wheezed and died, spoke through hiccups and sniffs. The old bastard sells drugs. She pointed at the storefront and at a glowering Mr. Cooper, still holding his gun at the ready. God wouldn't, he wouldn't have wanted men to sell things like that and try to defy him. 
There was a long pause in torturous silence. I should hardly think that matters now. This sinner killed a righteous boy. You wonder why he ignores your prayers? Well, look to the monster in your own town. The tone was serious, but as someone unconvinced by the stranger, I could hear amusement. Preacher, I'll blow your head off. You don't stop this. You aren't any man I've ever seen. You don't belong in this town. Such intolerance. This is the folly of man. You will be judged. Father Salvador turned to Mr. Cooper, then back to the now regrouping flock. Harshly. The priest began to walk away. Mr. Cooper leapt from his shop and ran towards the Salvador, his usual calm entirely abandoned for a brief moment of insanity. He pulled the trigger. Click. The town was upon him. I couldn't see anything besides a sea of people and whirling limbs. There were shouts of hate and anger and one long shriek of desperation. Then everyone dispersed and I was alone, staring at the body of Mr. Cooper, one arm torn off when I removed, and his shotgun shoved so far down his throat that all that rose from his mouth was the bloodiest stock. He was in a heap next to Connor, whose arms had been folded and eyelids shut. This seems like a good place to pause and explain something that even I wondered when looking back. Why didn't I just leave town right then? It was hard. Sometimes, even when faced with such extreme conditions, it's hard to just abandon your life and your family, everything you had ever known. It's easier to try and justify, to perform increasingly difficult mental gymnastics, and that's what I did. It also didn't help that I had no car, I had no money, I had nowhere else to go. My family, extended family included, all lived in Buford. If I ran, I wouldn't get far. And I was a good girl, not about to steal a car. So I stayed. I stayed until things got worse. I didn't leave the house for two days after the incident at the pharmacy. I kept the blinds drawn and the door locked. While my imagination ran wild, conjuring images of friends and family being the next victim, the next sinners, I hadn't seen or heard from my mother in some time, but my father was always around, stomping in the living room or slamming doors. He never knocked on my door, though. I'd hear him walk up to my room, sigh, and walk away, as if he expected I'd soon forgive him threatening me. I'd always hold my breath every time. But there was nothing for me in my room. I knew, or just feared, that eventually this door would be broken down and I would be dragged into the street. It isn't that I had done anything wrong, but my thoughts were not the town's thoughts. My father knew that, but I wanted so badly to still trust him. He was my father after all. No matter what he said or did, I could always trust he would protect me. Couldn't I? But soon enough, the fear subsided and I began to get angry. I was angry at everyone. I was angry that my father could brush off this violence so easily. I was angry that a town set on strict morals could dive so deep into hypocrisy. I was angry at the priest. Sure, Eric exposed the subconscious darkness, but Father Salvador brought it to the light. Then he bathed in it. What man of God would do such a thing? Is he a man of God at all? I wasn't so much a woman of God myself, but it was time to pay the preacher a visit. The idea of leaving the false security of my home brought with it a small fit of worried vomiting. But I leapt, clammy and shaking, taking one slow step at a time out of my room and down the hall and down the stairs and to the door and... Where are you going, Maddie? Every muscle in my body tensed up at the same time. My mouth went dry and the words came out a jumbled mess. For, for a walk, my father peered from the living room off to my right, he was wearing his best blue suit, but it was wrinkled and stained in brown and red. There were bags under his eyes, and he held a leather-bound Bible, one thick finger bookmarking a page. He cocked an eyebrow, smiled, and exhaled through his nose. Well, be careful out there. You were upstairs so long, I worried. You may have killed yourself. Where's Mom? I don't know where the boldness came from, but seeing this man smile set a fire in me. My mother was dead. I knew she was dead. I could feel it, but I wanted him 
to tell me how. My father, James Montgomery, a good godly man, took a deep breath and spoke. Your mother was a sinner. She knew it was only a matter of time until all those good people in town set their sights on her, so she left. He didn't make eye contact during the last sentence, becoming more interested in a spot of chipping paint on the wall. Bullshit. I channeled all my anger into that word. The smile on James' face dropped, and I watched his jaw tense. She was a sinner. His nostrils flared as he recalled what must have been a disgusting memory. There was no sin he could think of that he could hang on her and not hang on himself. I would press him, but I didn't care for the why anymore. Where is she? On the cross? I couldn't help keep my eyes from widening. James flashed me a toothy smile again. I wasn't sure I cared so much that a woman so bent on murder was dead, but to have died by the hand of the man she married? I flung the front door open, sprinting from the house as James' voice echoed behind me. Be careful out there. I'd prefer you'd come home in one piece. That was just James. That couldn't have been my father. That hadn't been my father since Eric. No. James Montgomery didn't have a hand in the hanging of Eric. James spoke out for his friend, right? My memories overwrote themselves, twisting to save me the pain of confronting the truth. There is no good in this town. God was gone, and no one in Buford ever cared to listen to him in the first place. The main strip was silent. Storefronts held broken windows, but there were no bodies. There was no cars. I walked through the eerie scene, expecting to be attacked, clutching my trusty knife, but afraid of having to use it. Nothing happened. I made it to the church without issue before realizing what day it was. There was a reason my father was in his suit. He had just come home from the first mass of the day. I walked all that way, so turning back would just prolong the inevitable. I grabbed the Polish brass and opened the door onto packed pews. Instead of the laughter and whispered rumors and handshakes, it was silent. Most people sat hunched, head buried in the Bible, but a few looked up at me with scowls before returning to read or stare at the book. Father Salvador was out front, so I made my way around the pews towards his quarters. Before I could even knock on the thick oak door, a weak voice growled from within. It's open. I picked my head in first, gently opening the door a few inches, choosing to inspect the room before presenting myself to the priest. He was sitting in an office chair facing a window. One hand rested on a desk to his left, drumming thin long fingers on a stack of books. You will find your answers here, my child. He spoke each word slowly, tasting and enjoying his own cliché. Please, have a seat. I'm fine standing, thanks. There wasn't time for games, and that fire I felt earlier only grew as Father Salvador swung around. I finally got to look at his face, and I was disarmed. He had soft blue eyes mounted above a graying, well-trimmed beard. This was the man I wanted to hate. He stood up and limped towards me, having to steady himself with his desk. Then I suppose I'll stand as well. Seeing his face as he spoke was hypnotic. The growling, the snarling, the thunder, and the darkness all disappeared. He was just a sweet old man talking to a misguided girl. No, no, you sit. You, you're limping. The fire in me was dying. Maybe he was right. Maybe we needed to right our sinful ways. I began to think, well, good thing I'm here to discuss it with him. Oh, now, you don't pay any mind to that. I'm an old man. Limping is just part of the job description. His laugh was warm. I found myself beaming and giggling along with him as we both decided to sit. Tell me, what has brought you here? Well, I didn't know. Was I really assuming such a kind priest could cause such harm? Buford was always a powder keg, so it stood to reason it was only a coincidence that Father Salvador showed up in time for the fireworks. Somehow, I was second-guessing the past few days. Everyone's so violent lately, aren't they? He frowned and grabbed a weathered Bible from his stack of books. Now, in Genesis, 
we learn about the snake, right? I nodded, but he wasn't waiting for me to agree. That was an easy one. The snake was punished. God turned away from man for a moment, but we knew just where the issue was. I imagine, Madison, you understand the evils of temptation. Well, yes, but I looked around the office and noticed something strange. There wasn't a single cross in the room. Suddenly, the kindly face before me was cast in shadow as the priest shifted behind his desk lamp. Sometimes, with so many people and so much new temptation, it takes a while to find the snake. He hissed the last words. I couldn't tell him. Suddenly didn't care whether the sound was for effect was simply the biggest hint of my life. I had brought a vial of holy water. I almost hadn't, and I threw it, a vial and all, just to sell with the roast's full height, just as his eyes turned to Cat's eyes. The glass shattered on his face, and he screamed. The pre-skin bubbled and melted, revealing something red and gnarled and sinister, gritting its shark-like teeth in pain. The thing in priest closed pushed past me as I made for the door, storming out into the congregation, shrieking at the worshippers. The girl is the sinner. Show your love to God. No one seemed to pause at the demonic face, instead turning scowls towards me. The door was beyond the mob, and I wouldn't be able to skirt around them. But I was near a candle, and I was near a tapestry. The fabric erupted, a fitting backdrop. The crowd rushed forward and I ran to the altar. The fire spread faster than I expected, leaking up into the wooden rafters. No one paid the flames any attention, and Father Salvador led the herd. He looked like crimson granite, all of his skin becoming the same gnarled texture. I had one last hope, my dagger. I had the dagger in my jacket, unsure if I could use it. I knew I could. The fire roared and I stood on the altar, a preacher surrounded by a hateful congregant. I brandished my knife and the townspeople, maybe fifty and all laughed, mirthless laughs. Father Salvador gave a sermon over the sound of the flames. This, friends, is the face of sin. This is why God has turned away from us and... Look at him. Look. Does he look like a priest? I shouted, hoping someone had enough sanity to notice the fucking demon standing in front of them. Some people turned from me to Salvador, and I continued, Look at his head. That isn't a halo. He had sprouted two spiraling horns that dug like slow drills from his forehead. More people turned to see. One man even spoke. But, but he's taught us so much. The man sounded like he was asking more than stating. Has he? He's taught us to kill. Think of the lives we've lost trying to get God to love us. That shall not kill, right? There are no other stipulations there, right? People were backing away from the priest. Father Salvador took a step forward toward me. The man who had spoken ran toward Salvador. You did this! That would-be hero grabbed the priest's arm and started to convulse, foaming at the mouth and falling to the floor. More people backed away, moving towards the door. But debris was falling. The burning rafters shed pieces of ceiling down on the scattering crowd, crushing bodies like dead leaves. I was focused on Salvador, feet now entirely turning to hooves, clicking his way across the altar towards me. I matched him, edging backwards, knife still in hand, until I felt the wall behind me. It was time to fight, and I prepared to stab the demon, unsure whether it would do any good. He was upon me, inches from my face with breath like sulfur. I'm going to pick you apart for eternity, girl. He raised a clawed hand, but the fire reached a crucifix, and the iron sculpture must have melted from the wall. The priest was pinned, shrieking again, this time in pain, as his skin rippled and burnt, pouring black blood onto the floor. You think you've killed me? I stood there shaking. If God is real, and he is eternal, he snarled smiling, then so am I. He cackled. The body emptied of black blood and all turned to ash. His voice still echoed. It is in such a long way down. Then there was fire. I was alone in a room full of flames, a church full of flames. The irony is pretty funny in hindsight, but in that moment I just continued to shake. 
I didn't try to move or really register anything as I scanned the burning pews. There were a few people still trying to dodge falling fireballs and get to the door. I knew I had to run, but it seemed so hopeless. My feet dragged like an infant when I finally got going, stumbling down the steps of the altar. I took my time as the building collapsed around me, but all the debris shedding from the ceiling seemed to miss me, almost deliberately. Beams fell on flaming obstacles, giving me a path to the door. I still trudged in slow motion, but I didn't feel in danger. Even the door, crackling under the immense heat, fell off the hinges before me. My guide through the inferno only served to reinforce my own disbelief. I didn't run home. I didn't kiss the road in front of the church. I continued to plod home wearing what I imagined was an entirely vacant expression. I knew my father waited there. Buford changed after that fire. There was a shift and all semblance of religious sacrifice evaporated. It turned to revenge. The killing continued without the mob justice, evolving the whole place into something like the Wild West. Or so I heard from a couple of friends that managed to escape. I ran and never looked back after the church burned down and after I finally confronted James Montgomery. He was in the window when I made it to the curb before our lawn. He was in the lawn by the time I reached the sidewalk. How was church? He didn't want an answer. He was holding a silver cross in hands. The thing was about the size of a dinner plate and James kept it up at his chest. I didn't say a word. I just stared at the man. I tried to give you a way out of here. He spoke matter of factly as if he had been doing me a favor. You wanted to go to that devil of a school Go learn from heathens. Your mother, may she rest in peace, that it would be good. I just knew that if word got out, well, you'd have been swinging with Eric. You really believe it, don't you? Do you know what Father Salvador was? Was? His eyes widened and his mouth slipped open. What did you do? He didn't stand to hear my response, launching from his spot into full sprint towards me. He wasn't a small man and now I'm not a large girl. He was upon me. His fists felt like bricks, and then they stopped. His hands were at my throat, gurgling, choking. I could feel the pressure from his thumbs, digging into the soft tissue of my neck. Lights began to dim, but he had dropped a cross beside me, and I grabbed it. He didn't notice. He continued to press. His grip relaxed on the first strike to his head. He fell limp, when the tip of the silver sunk into his eye. I shimmied out from under James Montgomery's corpse. His blood ran down my face and chest. It was then that I noticed the crowd of neighbors standing and watching in silence. Some had their hands cupped over their mouths. Some held weapons. Honor thy father and mother was shouted from somewhere in the pack. The rest joined in the chant and the circle descended. I ran into the house, slamming shut the door. Fist and feet pounded on the other side. And as I bolted for the garage, the sound of splintered wood signaled that I didn't have much time. I wasn't allowed to get my license. It became a law some years prior, a way to keep younger generations from exploring the world filled with new ideas. But James had a car. He had a big one, an SUV that could seat 10 and hopefully just as easily plow through the same amount. I grabbed the key from a hook beside the light switch, throwing closed the metal door that led from our laundry room to the garage and barricading it with a wooden board leaned under the knob. It wouldn't hold long, but I jumped into the beast and the engine roared to life. The garage door tore like paper mache and I was in the street. I won't pretend I hadn't taken a test drive when my parents went to church, but being chased by an angry town changes the experience a bit. Bodies lunged at the truck and bodies thudded and crunched under the wheels. I floored it. Watching skulls bounce on the hood, people rolling over the windshield. I caught glimpses in the rear view of ragdolling neighbors flung over the roof of the car, crumpling in heaps. I floored it and didn't stop. Buford was surrounded by mountains, and there was only one road out of town. Luckily, I lived on it. It was a straight line, and no one followed me, or I didn't notice. There was a diner, because there's always a diner in the middle of nowhere. I sat down, still caked in blood, but no one took notice. The waitress grimaced and offered me coffee. 
I had never had coffee before. I was overwhelmed and between the caffeine and adrenaline, I started to sob. One trucker at the counter turned to look, made a face close to pity, then turned back to his meal. I sat in the diner until the waitress gave me a curt, were closed. Then I was outside, driving towards nothing, hoping a cop would pull me over, but this was nowhere. There's no one to save you when you're nowhere. I would stop periodically to breathe. The stars would watch me and I looked up wondering which one was God. Or maybe he never existed at all. Salvador's words had stained me. It isn't such a long way down. Maybe he was right. Maybe that's where we were all along.